When were you born? I was born in 1925 in France. And I was in France until I was three. Then we moved to Broadwater Down. And I was in Broadwater Down from the age of three till I married. Now, number 16 was the headquarters of the signals. That was the main, where the signals worked from. Um, the army signals. Mm -hmm. Number 18 was the RASC, Royal mm -hmm. Army Service Corps. Uh, and then the Royal Engineers were the other side of the road. They, they take all these big houses up. Was it Millionaire's Row? Is that what yes. the road was known as? That, well, that that's what Broad Down was called before, because they reckon it was only the wealthy could live up there. I mean, we lived there, but we, that was a job. It was a lovely house we had with mm. the job. For house, when you think before the war, it wasn't an old cottage or anything. It was a beautiful house. It's on the... Well, it's still there. Yeah. If we ever drive along there, I'll show you. I had a lovely bedroom. It was lovely. It really was nice. A nice staircase. Very modern. And just for a little while, I was at a county school the beginning of the war, I thought this is ridiculous and um, I didn't bother to go anymore because I wasn't doing anything. We spent all our time down underground so I stopped going and that was the end of my schooling and then this friend said um, uh, you want a job I said she said well I'll get you an interview she was a secretary to the manager at Lloyd's Bank on the hill and um, she got me into Lloyd's Bank and I went up to London for training I was going up and down in the raids then yeah and then I came back to this Lloyd's Bank and I was there until I got married yeah didn't you teach yourself to type as well yes I went I had to because uh, Playing the piano, I was quite sort of flexible, you know. And um, I went to a night school and I didn't stay there long because I knew the keyboard, I could knew the keyboard off the heart soon because I was used, I didn't want the shorthand. I wasn't going to be a secretary in two shorthand. And I just wanted to get speed up and I hired a typewriter from Gordon Curry's in the high street for a month and I sat at home practicing on this typewriter and got the speed up so when I went in the bank I was already I was okay it was a pound I remember this hire this typewriter from the high street Gordon and Curry's some good days at the bank. I enjoyed my life at the bank. Some nice girls to work with. They worked you hard though, didn't they? Sorry? They worked you hard. Well, the war broke out. We, they had these big machines. They don't have them now. You, to do ledgers, you sit there, you put the, sh you had the thing there with all the sh names and sheets the alphabet, you know, you put that sheet in there like that, clamp it down, and you'd have all the checks here for that name, and you'd type it and put it in, take it out and put it back. And these machines were very precious. They were made in Canada. 
So they moved us right down in the basement, under the bank, because the machines were precious. There was no air conditioning. It was absolutely stifling down there. It was low pitched. Yeah. But we had to, that was our job. And But I mean, they wouldn't be allowed to do it now. But that was our job. But I did enjoy the nice girls at the back. back to Lloyd's here. Mm. And it was on the on the corner opposite the War Memorial, yeah, the wasn't one. it? Mm. Yeah, the big one, opposite Assembly Hall, yeah. Yes. A lovely building, that stone building, I think. Lovely stone, isn't it? Mm. Because opposite was... Um, what was opposite? Oh, down there. They, they built the... The Ritz, and the over top was a lovely tea room. And Wednesdays and Saturdays they had tea dances, four to six. And because we could look straight across the road from our rooms upstairs in the bank, it mm. depends which room floor you were working on. And we used to work like stink Wednesdays and Saturdays to get over there to get in that tea dance. <laughs> Was it quite formal, the tea dances? Was there yes. kind of social uh, rules? Uh, I'm trying to think of her name. Stan, worked, he worked, he played the drums and he worked at Shell and he played the drums and his wife played the piano. So it was only piano and drums. But, um, I mean, it wasn't a huge floor, but it was, uh, it was a nice floor up there in the, and all the tables and chairs were right round, right round. Yeah. And um, we, they said war broke out. And we came out, we came out, and Dad was waiting outside. And he said, um, uh, you better hurry home. So Trevor and I rushed, rushed home. Um, we heard some planes and we thought, all those started, you know. Wow. But, uh, but it was, um, yeah, I remember, we were going down to uh, Wedding at Paddock Wood. And there was Dad, I don't know, Trevor must have been with us. We had this little... Uh, he had this four prefect. He managed to say he'd been saving up petrol because we had a massive garage at Broadwood. And um, we said, we got enough petrol to go down to Pallet Wood to this wedding, you know, of uh, some relation of his. And we had to keep stopping and jumping out because they were fighting overhead and the bullets were full. Keep jumping out of the car and getting in the ditch. Goodness me. And getting back in and drive on a bit further. But that was a bit later, wasn't it? That was in 1940. Yeah, yeah well... That was the day of the big Yes, the day fight. of the big air. Mm. It was in September, I think it was September 21st. It's a date they've always bringing up. Mm. What they called the Battle of Britain mm. day. Well, I say, I, I was going up and down the train in the blackout. You couldn't see 17. Couldn't see who you were sitting next to, and there was probably an air raid on the time I got on the train in London come home. And then you get out, and there was an air raid on. I say, I met the padre, and he walked all the way back to Broadwater with me. What are you walking about in this, he said. And there was all these soldiers a bit. But nobody ever put a foot wrong. Nobody. It's funny. You wouldn't dare do it these days. No, walk up. Because obviously when war broke out, you were 14. No, uh, no. Uh, 16. I was 16 when I started. Mm. No, but when war broke out. 
you were 14. Oh, yeah, well... So you spent... No, you spent no. your whole teenage years, really, at, yeah. you know, at war. I, and it, it's how you talk so casually about it. You know, you don't talk about being afraid or don't talk about being... Obviously, it's such an unusual situation. I suppose it does seem like it now, but that was life, and you just... There's nothing you do about it, was there? No. And the blackout, and you all... Everybody walked about with bloody gas masks, <laughs> box on your shoulder. <laughs> so, yeah, you had to carry that <laughs> oh, everywhere. Oh, you had to go everywhere with that. <laughs> I couldn't bear it. Oh, God, I put it on. I thought, I don't know what I'd do about it. Oh, I suppose you'd have to, but... <laughs> but we all got the issue with this gas mask. <laughs> wonder what happened to those. Mm -hmm. But when they came back, they just took over the houses. Because they, you know, they just came, they had to get out quickly. Yes. So that's how we came to have 12th Corps there. And we had um, General Andrew Thorne. He was there for a year, and then, um, and of course they had the life of Riley, their the wife, wives and families in the town. And he was there for about 13 months, I think it was. Then he got transferred, I don't know where he went up to London or somewhere. And this is when Monty came and took over. On a Sunday afternoon, three o'clock, and he took over and he posted around all the messes, which was big houses, where the, the RAC were in one lot, the Royal Engineers were another, the Signals were in, they were all in different big houses. Mm. And um, he posted a thing in there, all wives and families to be out of the town in 48 hours. Oh, goodness. That was Monty, because he was in a set-up... Uh, and he used to sit out on the lawn with all these mats around him. He was, looking back, he was uh, working out his Egyptian, you know, when they went over. The North Africa campaign. North Africa campaign. Because my dad used to take him out a sun hat and said, you're going to get sunstroke. He used to sit out there on the lawn with all these mats around him. Yeah. I was trying to think, because I used to go home down to time. It must have been when I was working in London. Because it was when I got home that night, Mum said, we've had the King here to lunch today. She said, after I'd gone to work, yeah, because I used to go and get the train. She said after I'd gone, the chef came, said, could he borrow her silver and her linen? And he said, they just told me the king's coming to lunch today because they hadn't got anything in the mess there, so, yeah. Goodness me. And was that when Monty well, was still here picture, or had he gone? The, well, that famous picture of them coming out of our front door at number 10. Yes, I have to dig that out, yes. Uh, Yeah, there's King coming out of Monty's. Yeah, they were living the life of Riley. So, uh, now, he wasn't very popular, <laughs> but, you know, he was right. There was a war on. Tell and me that about... That was when he started them training, and in Norwich Park, and running, and uh, church parades, and... I've never seen St Mark's Church so full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to go. Yeah, because I used to have to scuttle out and scuttle down Broadwater to get in the gate before he did, because he got down to number 10, to the gate, and stood there, and they had to march. Normally they just disappear, you know, come out of church and disappear. They had to march 
right the way down through Broadwater and he took the salute after church parade. He was quite a showman. <laughs> well, I suppose it was right, really. But Mum used to say, we, his Batman used to say, bring all his medals or badge or whatever it was on his jumpers or whatever. Could you sew these on? He said, I'm not much good at sewing. <laughs> so your mum would sew Monty's? Oh, she'd sew them, and I said, yeah, she'd have to sew all these colours on, these things on. Yeah. So did you have much contact with Monty himself? Did you... Not me personally. I kept, you kept out of his way, really. You didn't sit because he hadn't got a lot of time for women, to be honest. Mother used to, when he came in and had been out all day, the flag on the car, because the sign for 12th Court <coughs> was an oval sign, with three trees, the oak, the ash and the elm. That was 12th Court sign. Okay. And... Um, this flag on the front of the car, every time they came in, it was tearing with the wind. Mm. Mother used to have to stitch that back with. And it's Batman, she used to say, I can't do this. And Mother used to stitch all my Monty's. You see all these things on his jersey, you know, when you see pictures of him, you know, different. Yeah. What, your mother yeah. sewed them on, did she? Well, it's Batman said, oh, could you do these? I can't do them. Really? And when he used to, because he was quite a showman, I mean, and when he used to come in, um, turn into Broadwater, uh, he always had three outriders, motorbikes, one each side and one in the front. And when he turned into Broadwater, they all, and, his, and Ken, they all had to start sounding their horns. Really? So you could hear him coming. So when he got turned in the drive, right around the drive, at the front door was standing, with ADCs hadn't gone out with him, his ADCs, and uh, Sergeant of the Mess and Batman and all standing there waiting for him, you know. Real sort of show, and from that point of view, he Brilliant. was. But... Um, and because he used to sit down on the lawn in the heat with all these maps around him, but of course he was, I mean, you, we didn't know what he was doing, did we? You can't see ahead. But he, that was when he was planning his Eighth Army thing, see, because he went to the Eighth Army. Was that uh, North Africa? And that. Hmm. and that was his next posting? And then he went to... to uh, he did the second army, didn't he? Because he gradually went up to field marshal, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Because Dad used to say, you're going to get sunstroke. He used to take him out one of his straw hats. <laughs> You've got to tell me about the the car, the particular, and the petrol. I love oh, this story. <laughs> one of his Batman, one of his um, ADCs was named... Sheriff. I don't know if it was Sheriff. It's in Horrocks. And he was part owner of the Ritz Hotel in London. It's just not like it is now, these companies. And he used to toddle off up there for the weekend and out of the way, I suppose. I think they were glad to get out of the mess because, see, Mont they all like to drink. Mm. I mean, when Andrew Thorne, when Thorne was there, they, after dinner, they all went into what they called the ante room, mm. uh, which was Mr. Trapman's a great big library, we know before. But uh, they all went in there, and that's where they sat and chatted and drank all in the evening. I'm talking about the brigadiers and mm. just them. But when Monty came, that all stopped. They disbanded into there, but it was talks and maps and you know, all future, all, you know, it was all real business. <laughs> and 
Mm. So he really wasn't very popular from that point of view. <laughs> um, but one of the NGCs, I say, huge man, great big stomach on him, used to walk out when he had big swing doors to the kitchen area. He used to hit it. Ken said he used to hit hit it with his stomach. They called him Blowgaff. Yeah. <laughs> He knew when Blowgaff was coming, the door swung open. But he used to say to Ken sometimes, not every weekend, some weekends he'd say, because he probably didn't go up there every weekend, if you can milk the old man's car. The old man being Monty. Monty the official car. <laughs> you can have, have the car, I said. So... Somehow, obviously, they they would, <laughs> you know. Somehow, they milked he milked it. Um, it was a Packard, great big two seater with a dicky seat. I told you, like you see on the American films with the youngsters driving about, don't you? In the old films, especially. Mm -hmm. Very long, now. That was yellow. And what? Whose car was that? His ADC. That was Blowgaff's car. Yeah. And um, we used to go, we went over to Dad's brother at Fletching. They had that big store there that sold everything from shoes to you, groceries, you name it. Because there was nothing else about in those days in the post office. And, and we used to go over there. <clears throat> and we used to stop in the pub on the way home. No, I was working in the bank. I had a phone call one day. They said there was a phone call for me, and I went, this man rang, and he said, you don't know me, but someone's given me your name. Well, I don't know who, because I've never done it before. I've never sung anywhere. He said, I've always wanted to get a group of people, young people together, to get a show together. He said, I've got a... A young, he worked at Stormont's, he said, um, tenor, but I haven't got anybody, uh, soprano. I said, well, I've never sung anyway. Anyway, he got my name. Well, would you come along to our rehearsal tonight for an audition? <laughs> so I went along and it was in front of all this other lot. Anyway. I was in, <laughs> and that was my, my first show. And that was, was and it, it was youth, calling? youth Calling? And what year was that? Uh, I was 17, 18, so... Uh, 42 then? Yeah, I suppose it was. Yeah, so middle, okay. Yeah. So you started performing. Yeah. Middle of the war. And you did performances yes. all at the yes, Opera we House. Yes, did uh, um, uh, concerts for the army. Um, you know, they used to. To entertain the troops. Entertain the troops, yeah. What kind of songs would you sing? Ivan Novello and stuff, mainly, you know, then. <laughs> The same old songs I hadn't sung any others. <laughs> I had a couple of dresses made. I had to beg, borrow, and steal coupons for material because you couldn't just have one frock on all the time. Um, and I had a dressmaker up St John's, but she was very, very good. Um, used to borrow coupons to get some material. There used to be a shop in the high street, and in some which was called Badley's. They just sold, you wouldn't remember, materials. They were on bales. And they used to get them off the shelf. And unroll them. And, and roll it, and all this for going on, and measure it off. <laughs> yeah. 
well, you couldn't buy our dresses, but that was easier to do like that, you see, coupon-wise. So were you accompanied by a band when you, when you sung for the troops? Well, when I was assembly, yeah, 21-piece orchestra. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've never sung before with a bloody piano, let alone a 21-piece orchestra. Oh, dear. But it was, it was, you know, that was breaking the ice. Yeah. <laughs> God, dear. And it was at the time when In The Mood, you know, the In The Mood. Oh, yes. Uh, Glenn Miller. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. Well, he used to stand, they used to stand outside that window on the Wales Hill then, because they knew we were in there, whistling, all of them, whistling that da 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 da, da. And every time they went past the house in Broadwater, da 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 da, da. <laughs> my mother used to say, are you in that window? <laughs> Well, actually, that he, he's the only one I've ever seen since the war. We'd just moved in here, and I had a phone call from Mary. She said, because we used to go over to Mary, we used to go dancing over up at Seven Oaks and places, you know, and um, he used to come over to there and they had the kennels her and her parents hundreds of dogs they had there and um, apparently he was down looking around and he the only collection he had was there so he went to the kennels at Hildenborough and said did they know Mary and the people that are there now well it's, we just moved in here 27 years ago and they said well yeah, she still lives in the village you see and sent him down there and of course she told him where I was here Oh. And she rang me up and said he was coming. And um, oh my God. Um, I opened the front door uh, and he said, 40 years on. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. His wife was walking down the drive behind him. He's the only one I've, the only one I've seen. So. The only one? Does that mean that. So your social life was pretty good then? Oh. Yeah, it was really. I mean, Go on. My parents kept a tight rein on me, but. But. Uh, uh, oh, I went out with the lieutenant and the signals. Yeoman, his name was, and when they marched up on duty, they changed shifts up to sixteen broad wall two. You know, they marched up. Sergeant in the front when they went past the house used to say, I was right. And, yeah. they looked at the and the mother used to say, You at that window again? <laughs> oh dear. They didn't care about him, he was leading the left the officer he was only a lieutenant in yeah. the front. <laughs> the sergeant. Oh yeah. Um but only we went to cinema a couple of times. I don't know what happened to him. He got moved on. <laughs> um then, oh, what was it after that? Uh, oh, they changed, Air Force changed. They had another nine come. And one day I was, I came home to lunch from the bank and I got back. It was funny enough, the same bus I used to come home from school at lunchtime mm. and get the same one back after lunch at the bank, you know. And, um, I was waiting down there and it was late, it had gone two o'clock and I was getting worried. And this Air Force chap stood there and I said, the bus is late. So I said, my supervisor would kill me. Well, what I didn't know was he didn't speak a lot of English. He said, supervisor. I said, yeah, you work in Woolworth? <laughs> He'd seen supervisor. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> The, so who, where was he so from? This was another Air Force chap, and he was Belgium. Oh right. And when I came out of work, the girls kept looking out the window and said, "There's a 
He's standing outside the bank with a bunch of flowers. And I came out of work, and that was the start of that. Went out with him for quite a long time. There again, we used to go dancing an awful lot. And we used to go to the tea dances over the cinema. There was a restaurant there. Oh, what, the old ABC? Yeah. Called the Florida Restaurant. They had tea dances Wednesdays and Saturdays. And we used to work that stink because we could see them from the bank across. We were on that level, you see. We could see them in there. They used to get in there and get a table ready, you know. We were working like a stink to get done. More Saturdays, Wednesdays wasn't very hopeful. We had to go to work dressed in the morning on Saturdays because you worked all the hours God made, and that was half day. You were lucky if you got done by three or four o'clock. So we used to go dressed for the tea dance half past eight in the morning. Um, and go over, over there tea dancing. He came from Belgium. His father, mother was a Belgian. He came from Antwerp. His father was a uh, Scot. <coughs> His name was George Dick, and he had a sister. And what happened was, when war broke, when they were overrun by the Germans, before they were overrun, he said, we suddenly looked out of the window and saw these paratroopers coming down. Germans. And they were all heading for some, a friend's house over there. They're best friends, and they never knew, and they were Nazi sympathisers. Yeah. So he and his father, because being his mother was Belgian, she was all right. So the, her and the girl stayed behind, who was twelve then apparently. And he and his father jumped on their bikes, rode like hell in Antwerp to the docks, got on the last boat to come over here. Goodness. Went to Cardiff where the grandmother lived. I suppose it would have been his father's mother being English, Scot. And um, then he joined, the, he joined the Air Force. And um, but he spoke, he spoke uh, English, well he spoke uh, Flemish. Flemish was spoken by the poor people, Flemish, French, English. German, and he was only 18. Wow, wow. Yeah, so I went with him quite a long time. And well, all the time he was here, a long time, it couldn't have been that long. Till they went, well, till they went over on D Day. Oh, that was that. Um, Do you know what happened to him? I saw him once, I had a telegram. And he said he was over here, meet me at Charing Cross at 3.30 or something. So I had to go to the accountant. I had a telegram, come to the bank, and ask if I could have the afternoon off. So I went up there and I met him. He was just over here quickly, 24 hours or something. I just met him. We went to a lion's corner house they had in those days and had a coffee or whatever, I can't remember. And um, it was funny because... He was a Catholic, my mother didn't like Catholics. And we had a Catholic padre here in, in at Twelfth Corps, obviously you had a different and you would never believe it after all this time we went in this large corner house and who should be sitting over there but this padre. And he came over, he said, You two still together <laughs> after all that time. It was only a one off, I never saw him after that. That was nice. Did your father have a role in the war, other than...? Well, he wanted to do something, but he didn't want to join the uh, Home Guard. So he joined the Royal Observer Corps. <coughs> and, um, which was a bit more elite, I suppose, I don't know, not really. And they had a uniform. Mm. So what was, like their, what was the role? The very... Okay. And they observed, uh, they have a post. Uh, one, the nearest one was up near Bromley, and the other one was up front. You go around the churchyard, 
when you get round the back of the churchyard as far as you can go to the where the hedge is, where the hedge is is where my grandparents are built and my parents are buried right by the mm. hedge. And there's a gate and you go through the gate and that's where their post was because they had a 90 degree view right over sort of Kent and Sussex, right, Tunbridge Road, right, and they could see for miles. It was an ideal Royal Observer. And then they would warn if they were coming over the Germans and they'd ring Bromley was the next one. So it warned them all. So they tell them how many how many bombers were coming over. Well, they would, they heard them coming, so they knew they were coming, and um, they they had a they could go down underneath. It was it was built underneath as well, so they could go down under, if they started bombing. Well, I mean, that was that was back that was back at Frank Churchill, yeah, and Dad. They had to learn all the planes. He had a book with all the different planes and German, you know. What kind of defences were there in Kent at the time? There weren't. Ken used to drive Monty down to look at the defences. He said, I don't know why we... That was his driver, and because he used to come into us every evening. Always came into us, spent the evening. And, and um, he said, don't tell your father, but he said, there's one gun between us and them. He said, that's down at... at uh, oh, dear. It's where... Sandy's mum lived, um... Rye? Yeah. Lid, kind of way. Lid. Lid. And I know she said, that's true. There was one gun there. Because <laughs> she'd always lived at Lid. Yeah. So if there had been an invasion, there wasn't much? No, that's why Ken said, don't tell your father. He said... I mean, just because Monty had been down all around, they think he'd been inspecting the de defences. <laughs> oh, dear. But we got by, didn't we? We didn't... But uh, I know we were out on the terrace one day. It was August by holiday Monday. And we heard wow, 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 the old Germans. Then we heard rat a tat tat, and they said, Oh my God, our boys had gone up, and they were shooting at them. And uh, that was the rat a tat tat, was where mm. they were firing mm. at them. And I know we had to get down on the terrace, no time to get anywhere. And the bullet, this was at the back of Tembrel Water. Um, you know, because the, the I know I got down on the gravel path, I always remember that. And it was always bang on in Monday and I'd just come from the hospital. I'd been to visit my f friend that I worked in, within the bank and she was in the hospital, she had appendicitis. And I'd just got in and Dad said, oh gosh, here they come, get down. <laughs> Must have been very frightening. Well, I suppose we got used to it. You didn't take any notice. You, as long as, you know. Yeah. Because he came home off the six o'clock in the morning shift and he said, they're sending pilotless bombers over now. That was when the first... Wow, wow, um, wow. Was it the V1s and the V2s? Yeah, the first one. The doodle bugs, yes. And of course, the first place to come right over, off the coat, you know. And he came home, and of course, I went to work that morning. I went, I was in the bank. I said, they're sending pilotless bombers over now. The next thing I knew, I was up on the carpet in front of the manager, 
for spreading rumours. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> and it was true. <laughs> yes. I mean, oh, during ball water, because the line, it was all, it's all lime trees, because they're much, much bigger now. But, um, mind you, they weren't new then, but uh, I can remember the army coming along with a Lysander. Do you, you've heard of Lysanders? No. Plain. No. Oh, chug, 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 chug. And they used to come over and, and ever so low and, and throw these great big like nets with green old stuff on them all over the tops of the trees along raw water. Because once the leaves are gone and the army headquarters was long there. So it was uh what's the word? Camouflage. Camouflage. Oh wow. But it was never bombed, they, they, that... No, no, uh, uh, I say, we heard this noise one night, but it was... I think what happened, they came over and they were dropping firebomb. It was meant for the station, obviously. Right. But, of course, from up there, it's only across the road, the Calvary Grounds, and, of course, he hit that glass place. That was That was where the noise was coming from mm. but was that the only time that Tunbridge Wells was hit by well yes we never we were lucky really because they were making for London all the time you see mm. you'd hear them wah, wah, wah. and once they'd gone over you thought oh and of course they but apparently some of them used to just drop them up Bromley way and not up mm. Just to get rid of them and get back. Uh, you know, this is a joke. They couldn't be bothered, I suppose. Mm. 